my name is Robin Godfrey, and I'm the Executive Director of Gala Choruses. And my name is Jane Ramsire Miller. I serve as Artistic Director for Gala Choruses, and I'm also in my 26th year as Artistic Director for One Voice Mixed Chorus, an LGBT chorus. Um, really nicely connected to the work of what Cora Allegro is doing, and we are in Minnesota. The organization is, is called Gala Choruses. It is technically an acronym, Gay and Lesbian Association, but we are a membership association of LGBT and supportive choruses. So Gala was incorporated in 1983, and it came from the beginnings of uh, three different groups. In 1975, Kathy Roma founded the Anacrusis Women's Choir in Philadelphia. In 77, the Gotham Men's Chorus formed in New York and evolved into what we know today as the Stonewall Chorale. And in 1978, upon the assassination of Harvey Milk, the San Francisco Gay Men's Chorus formed. A few years after that, San Francisco undertook a very ambitious tour across the country and ended up spawning choruses in many of the cities that they visited on their tour. And that was really how Gala Choruses got started. The first event kind of resembling what we know today as festival there was a West Coast Choral Festival in 1982. And then uh, what's usually thought of as Festival One uh, is called Coast, Come Out and Sing Together. It happened in New York in 1983 with 12 choruses. We now have 185 member choruses spread across the United States, Canada, and Mexico. Uh, and within those choruses, we have about 12,000 singers. Well, and I'll just add to that, that I think in those beginning days, there was this real divide between the, the lesbian community and the gay men's community. And mixed choruses played a really important role in bringing those communities together and creating relationships that, that maybe had not been existent before. I, I know for my own chorus, it was really the AIDS epidemic that um, brought these communities together. And it was a, a, a big part of how One Voice was formed just around the time that Coro Allegro was formed as well. And we would be remiss if we did not mention our youth choruses and even more recently transgender choruses. Those two communities are also a really, really rich part of our history. And I remember at gala events just being so eager to connect with mixed choruses. I just wanted to say to, to David and to Cora Allegro how important it has been to have your chorus as a role model within gala choruses. Uh, in terms of commissioning, in, in terms of the, the Amplifying Back Voices series. Every time your newsletter comes, I read it. I, I open it up, I say, okay, what's David programming now? Because he's got <laughs> all these great ideas. I am always in touch with what Cora Allegro is doing. And I want to thank you, thank you for your legacy and for your leadership and um, the beautiful, beautiful, powerful work that you create in this world. Thank you very much. That's very kind. I was just thinking back to how I found out about Gala and what my connection was. Before we ever went to Gala, I attended a um, workshop for gay and lesbian, at that time, chorus leaders. That was formative for me because it was really my first connection to the movement, this chorus, this choral movement. I brought back the idea that we want to be connected to Gala. I think Gala got an award from ASCAP, maybe? because the gay and lesbian choral movement was on the forefront of creating and um, patronage really of the creation of choral music in the United States at the time. That was really eye-opening for me. That something that I thought of as uh, very intimate in a way, the connect, the participation in the chorus and the process of making music together and the every Sunday night, you know, rehearsals for perpetuity. Not only were we part of something bigger where other people like us were doing something similar in other church basements across the country on other nights of the week um, and performing in their communities and building those bridges, 
um, but that we were actually responsible for the creation of new music that was gonna live on in the canon was pretty mind blowing. And I think that that's part of how Coro and the board and David, we all came together to commit to the, to creating new music and commissioning music over the many years that Coro now has done that. Uh, I am so pleased to be here with my good friend, composer Kenneth Fuchs. In 2018, he won the Grammy Award for the Best Compendium Album with the London Symphony Orchestra uh, backing. Uh, we're here today to talk about our first collaboration in the clearing. I'm so pleased to be here with you and to celebrate the legacy and the important role that, that Gala plays in our community. And I will never forget the first time I heard Coro Allegro in 1993. I was so impressed by the chorus, the musicianship, your leadership and the mission of the group. And I felt right then and there that I had to compose a work for you. And I'm gonna just quote a little bit from the, um, the program note for, for, for the cycle. And I wrote, Robert Frost's lovely poems are ideally suited to Coro Allegro's gentle sensibility. I think because I was so moved by the mission of Coro Allegro, and I thought I wanna find a set of poems that reflects that, but, but also underscores in a, in a, a, a beautifully um, literary way um, what the group of people who comprise Coro Allegro, what their lives are about, what the mission is, and, and what it is to, to, to really stand up and, and be yourself, and, and how challenging that can be. You'd also talked about the, um, the metaphor of, of coming out. Frost so beautifully evokes the world that he's writing about, but in the context of having the poem sung by a group whose mission is to make beautiful music, but also to, to, to further an extremely crucial social cause. And especially pointed when, when we, you know, considering that it was the, you know, the sort of the AIDS pandemic was, uh, was at the oh. same time. And so that last, that nothing gold can stay had yeah. resonated with so many people. The Coral Allegro performance was one of the few in that whole series of concerts that did a serious cycle when the chorus finished, Nothing Gold Can Stay, after all eight poems, and finished with that, the audience jumped up and started screaming and cheering and stomping. It brings tears to my eyes to think no. about <laughs> yep. it. It had such a powerful impact on that audience and I was so proud of that because that's exactly, I knew they got the message. That's exactly what I wanted wanted the piece to do. And the performance, I mean, it's so beautiful. I mean, that, that performance and the times I've heard you do the pieces and, and the recording, right? Mm -hmm. That you made early on, um, right. just right. It was just so clear to me that the piece somehow had to embrace um, the gay LGBTQ experience and the growth and transformation of what it is to be individually yourself and comfortable in your own sexuality. And, and the expressions of that have really grown so enormously since 1993. It's remarkable in a way. For this program, we'll be using devotion. You know, Gayla, um, uh, that was in danger of folding, you know, six or eight months ago. And so oh, yeah. one of the reasons that we're doing this program is that is that um, the devotion of 
the board and of the of the members, you know, has really uh, pulled it through a very difficult crisis. Oh, I'm so glad. Um, and uh, so we just thought that was that was the perfect piece uh, to perform. Wow. Um, I'm very you know very proud and very touched that you still still do them. I you know I wrote them with just great affection yeah. for you and and the chorus. Yeah. Yeah. Are there any members from the original? Like yeah. when I, yeah. So and they remember, you know, with great fondness the the performance and and uh, uh, and they too recount that 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 feeling of being on stage and having the audience just erupt in yes in, um, out of their seats. They just could. and you know the people would, from the first performance they ran from that hall to the second hall to hear it again. You know? <laughs> I mean that was. <laughs> you know, people had told me that, and I was just I was just blown away. So, we as a group, and certainly I as a composer, experienced the power of music. I mean, truly, the yeah. power of music to to move people to to a place of you know an emotional place, a place of understanding and and rejoicing, acceptance yeah. and rejoicing. And I'm, I'm, yeah. that's, that's yeah. what it's all about. It is. It is absolutely is. So yeah. I've always been out at work and everything, but being a member of Coro, you know, on Sunday evenings at rehearsals, I definitely felt a sense of community that I didn't feel in other parts of my life. And if you take that and put it on steroids, this is what you feel when you go to gala. I remember in San Jose that there was nobody else in town. I mean, it was basically deserted other than yeah. gala folks. And I felt like, so the gay singers have taken over the city. It was like a, a sci-fi film and one out of 10 being gay, it was like one out of 10 was maybe straight. The world could be like this. It was okay to hold hand, you know, like anything was okay because you figured everyone else walking down the street was gonna be totally fine with it. So to be um, in a majority in that space, yeah. you know, that was an experience I had never had. Even though, you know, coming from Boston, we have this kind of progressive bubble and there's always a lot of people at Pride, but it was different to have a little village of people like me. Che cheaper than an Olivia Cruz. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I went to some concerts on my own and um, I ended up sitting next to Daryl and we heard a, a group do a, sort of a, a piece about coming out. And I started crying and I, I hardly ever cry. I cry like once every 10 years maybe I cry I just even when I'm I just don't but I completely lost it and Daryl's like trying to comfort me and and we were right near the front and made it through the show or whatever and afterwards we were walking outside and we, we come across the choir who's leaving they're like it's the woman who was crying the whole time and they all <laughs> hug me like, <laughs> I always blubber like a baby several times a day at gala because yep. a lot of the music that was written was telling our stories yep. and you know you just don't hear that mm -hmm. every day i lost a lot of friends as i'm sure all of us did and in the hiv aids pandemic and one of my memories is the hiv positive chorus mm -hmm. i was sitting in the audience with some choral folks but also with some bgmc folks holding on to each other and just you know remembering our names and just bawling just the feeling in the hall that ran through the courage of the people on stage but then through the emotion and support and care and memory and loss of everybody in the audience it was palpable you know and it, it surrounded us it's it's not like anything else because my my choir has gone on several tours a um, couple of international ones the difference between going to those kinds of festivals where we're competing as a choir versus going to gala there's something so wonderfully generous about the whole gala experience, that we're out there to share and support each other. It occurred to me, festival is like the anti-pandemic. Festival is the opposite. <laughs> yeah. You no. know, you're sharing rooms with people you hardly know. <laughs> you're, you're, you're crammed into concert halls, cheap right. by jowl, standing room only. And thousands of people are singing together. Right. <laughs> super spreader. Right. Yeah, really. And it's super joy spreader, it really is. <laughs> One of the other things that's amazing about Gala is the breadth of production. <laughs> You know, I remember the Dallas Women's Chorus put on an operatic set almost. South uh, Pacific. With yes. the coconuts. Oh, that was yes. great. <laughs>
That was fabulous. <laughs> And then you had the like the guy, the group of like twelve senior guys from Palm Springs walking onto this huge stage and standing there in their in their pastel polo shirts. See these little choruses coming from isolated or rural areas or more conservative areas. Mm -hmm. To say I'm in that chorus and I'm singing and I'm in public and then doing this on a national and international stage. The music is wonderful, but that's really not even the point, right? right. It's the, the community, the camaraderie, the support. And what I love about Gala, of course, is that they all get standing ovations. Because <laughs> it's so incredible that they're there. That's what matters. Yeah, um, the showing up. I was really struck by the women's choruses. Mm -hmm. The repertoire was, you know, social justice, um, particularly news. And Oh, um, I remember... Amy, sitting next to you during when you first heard them. <laughs> yeah, I went out of my mind. And you that's, did. <laughs> that's when I said, we have to have a women's chorus in Boston. Yeah. Which then resulted in me starting the Boston Women's Chorus, which had a few other names, Boston Women's Rainbow Chorus. Now I'm in Muse, a women's <laughs> chorus. One of the things that I so loved about Tampa was the fact that we could hear every single group. Yeah. And that's always the trade-off. It's great that Gala's gotten so large, but I know Zach and I, every time we go, we're just struggling. We're looking at the, you know, mm -hmm. compete, I feel like competing programs. I have always stayed the whole time at every gala I've been to, and I'm glad because yeah. I I want to hear everybody. Well, I'm wearing my shirt from Gala in Montreal in 2004, which was my first gala, which was a pretty exciting and momentous gala to go to. Right after marriage, same-sex marriage became legal That's in right. Massachusetts, yeah. Barbara and I had just gotten married in May. Yeah, when we sang The Walls Come Tumbling Down, mm. that was thrilling. And then having just this huge hall full of people erupt, absolutely erupt into applause and cheering was, I mean, I had never experienced anything like it. It was, you know, it just filled your heart completely. I remember the sound of the mm -hmm. clap. It was like nothing I had ever heard before. of the London Gay Men's Chorus had run from the theater around to the stage door to applaud us again and just to tell us how much they love the set. And I was just so blown away. Actually, the VGMC always is there clapping for us when we mm. came out. And that meant a lot to me. Yeah. But when our guys are standing on stage and looking out and seeing all of the friends and all of the support inside of Boston from Coro and from Voices Rising, that's what makes this community special. I'm Craig Coogan. I'm the executive director of the Boston Gay Men's Chorus. I've been an audience member. I've been a board member of Gala Choruses. I'm proud to uh, be part of this incredible community. And I'm really grateful to be with my friends and colleagues from Coro Allegro 
talking about our appreciation for the work of Gala Courses. I stumbled into a small theater and listened to the Gay Men's Chorus of Los Angeles. I sat in the theater and for the first time, I heard my stories and my experiences reflected back to me. And the warmth and the acceptance of the audience immediately gave me this sense of belonging that until then I really was just looking for. That experience that I've had extends to every singer, every artistic director, and every audience member that I've engaged with over the last 30 years. But now there is music of our lives out and available for all of us to share. You know, we are all choral geeks and Gala Festival is our Olympics. The work of LGBTQ choruses remains as vital now as ever before. And Coral Allegro and Gala Chorus's leadership shows why. Aluda Continua tells a familiar story of the struggle for freedom through the life of David Cato, a prominent Ugandan LGBTQ activist who was tragically murdered in 2011. It is a story of hardship and hope, reckoning and resilience, but most importantly, about a community that refused to be silent in the face of tragedy. It reminds us all that the struggle continues until we have won freedom for everyone, everywhere. Thank you to Gala Courses for being a leader in that struggle. My name is David Cato de Sule. David is my Christian name. Cato is given to the younger of twin boys. And Chisule is the name of my clan. I was born on the 13th of February, 1960, in the village of Okawano, in the Makuno district, near Kampuna. My mother is near the She was a Uh, so this project actually started way back uh, before I even spoke to Eric about it um, with Tom Regan, um, who approached me uh, after his mother passed away. I wanted to do something meaningful for Coral Allegro. And when I had been on the board years ago, there was a large donation that kept the course going. I thought, you know, maybe this would be a good excuse to 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 be a major donor. And then David and I probably went out for drinks and, you know, talked about maybe a commission. and. He said, wow, you know, Eric has this, Eric is this great, you know, a composer who's on fire, who's doing all these different things. And he wants to do a piece about David Cato, this activist in Uganda who was killed, supporting LGBTQ plus rights. And, uh, you know, what about, and he just sort of put all the pieces out there for me. And I'm like, wow, this is very exciting. It seems like a real, real interesting project for Coro, even taking, you know, some risks that we'd never taken before. And I said, you know, I'm in. I mean, I first heard about the story on Rachel Maddow because it was the beginning of her show 10 years ago. So she, it was one of the first stories that she was telling or talking about. And I just, I remember the passion that she had in describing what had happened. But we met for coffee and you were telling me the story. You had these specific names and roles and ideas for how everything kind of fit together. And that's when I kind of said, well, this, you know, I'm the, you know, the last disciple of Bach here in Boston. Yeah. And the, it just screamed to me like, this is truly a passion. Like this is right. a passion play with, you know, cause there's this chorus of good, this chorus of evil. There's this preacher who almost serves an evangelist and David himself is this persecuted kind. And there are so many parallels now um, that we make between Michael Brown and George Floyd and Trayvon Martin about, you know, he was despised and rejected. Yeah. And and there's that, you know, the idea if we can't see Christ in someone like this, 
then what purpose it is does any of this serve at all? Right. And so, so having David as that central figure, it just locked into place. This was a passion about his life and death yeah. and the work that comes from that and continues on to this day. Right. This is a real life story, people living it and saying it as it is. So we're joined by Long Jones, who was friends with David Cato Chisuli and also colleagues and, and was an integral part of the story. And it was kind of amazing to sing words that Eric had written and then have John walk into the room. That was just kind of an incredible honor and moment. And our relationship since then has been so beautiful and so important to Coro Allegro. So uh, thank you, uh, Coro Allegro, because you guys are so amazing. And thanks to Eric. Awesome. I just I just hit record and you told me everything. <laughs> it all started with Scott Lively having to come to Uganda and having this conference with uh, people in authority. We were out here saying we do exist and we are Ugandans and we have a right to be who we are. And someone using the Bible is coming to sow seeds of hate other than preach um, or promote love and, you know, empathy. So I certainly physically am not the same as David was. I'm probably two or three Davids. Um, <laughs> but, but his voice and his words are five times the size of me and who I am and who I could hope to be. And it just, it fueled me with a drive to really kind of work towards these issues here at home. We didn't just get a sense of who he was and what he did in Uganda, but there became this kind of universal idea of David and the fact that his, his fight exists everywhere. We have to keep fighting. We know what we want. The world needs to really hear what's going on here or else we are dying, you know, we are dying. It's not just about Uganda, but everything that is happening around the world. It's just too much. People are being thrown out of the fl high floors in their countries because, you know, of their sexual orientation. When you guys let me know that the gala conference was coming up, I was like, I don't know. And then when you gave me the estimated number of people, oh my God, 6,000 LGBTQ or people who are, you know, progressive, I was like, wow. It was like a dream. I couldn't wait to get there. Reggie says the passion, people were hungry, hungry to hear about the stories of persecution beyond the borders of America. Where are these people going? Who do they look to? They look, they look at us. At the end of it all, when we leave this place, I expect each one of us to be an ambassador, an ambassador to go and share. Americans are so privileged. I, w I wanted this American myopia within the gay community to get opened up. I wanted people to start thinking more about w what the rest of the world was suffering. What, what I loved about seeing Coral perform at Gala was not, you know, not that the performance was fantastic, but that people that weren't involved in the esoterics or in Coro got to hear the story. 
And a lot of them were like, wow, I've never heard the story. And my response is like, open your eyes. I think we have to look at the, the LGBT community as a global one. You know, I remember very clearly at breakfast after day after our performance that several members of the, uh, the Turtle Creek Chorale, which is one of the more eminent gala choruses, I would say, and largest, uh, came over to us and said, "My with eyes wide, saying, oh my God, you guys are with Coral Allegro. The piece is amazing. That's what we should be doing. That's the kind of work that we should be doing. So that, that meant a lot to me as a gala member. That's great. Yeah. One of the one of the important ways that Gala has supported members, there are many actually. Uh, back during the the uh, AIDS HIV crisis, Gala choruses were a place for people to um, have community and to support each other, to come together, to grieve for members that were dying. So I have the dubious distinction of being the first executive director of Gala to survive more than one festival. And I also have the distinction of having been the only executive director who has ever canceled a festival. It has been an incredibly difficult time. Years and years of planning go into putting that event together. You know, this, this thing is near and dear to your heart. You've been birthing it for years and all of a sudden it's like, nope, we're, we're not gonna be able to do that. And then there was the very pragmatic revenues from festival represent more than 75% of the operating income of GALA. A GALA has no way to survive a notion of uh, there isn't going to be a festival. At the end of the day, it, it was a health and safety issue when there was no question about what the answer was in terms of the cancellation of the event. But the question became, uh, do we simply disband the association and take it through bankruptcy? Or do we attempt uh, to find another path that could keep us alive? Um, we first planned to try to reschedule for, well, we did reschedule for 2021. Uh, and it fairly quickly became apparent, uh, you know, it, it, living through the, the early parts of the pandemic, your world changed from breakfast to dinner what you thought seemed like a perfectly reasonable assessment of what the future held looked utterly ridiculous, you know, two weeks later. So it, it became clear pretty soon that 2021 wasn't going to work either. Uh, and as we talked about it internally, we said, well, you know, let's leave the decision about the future of the association up to the members. Let's at least make the ask to see if people are willing to donate registrations in the interests of keeping the association alive. And you, you know, you like to hope you're doing a good job at what you're doing, but you don't really know until you get into a situation like that and you see that incredible outpouring of, of love and appreciation for the association that was just unbelievably touching. Uh, and, and our board president through that period, Dwight Joyner made the comment, we've been through a pandemic before, we survived, we'll survive again. And from there forward, we began to say, okay, we're gonna find our way through this there clearly are a significant number of singers out there that want this association to survive. And we're going to find a way. Whatever it takes, we're going to find a way. We'll keep the association alive. We will help the member choruses get back on their feet as the pandemic allows for that. And that, that was the mission we undertook, find a way. And you did. And we did.
Devotion, such a beautiful piece by Kenneth Fuchs. Hello, my name is Bonnie McFarlane, and I'm the president of the board of directors of Coro Allegro. I sang that piece at the first Gala Chorus's quadrennial festival that Coro Allegro attended in 1996. It was the beginning of an amazing partnership between Coro Allegro and Gala Choruses. But at the time, those of us who sang with Coro Allegro weren't sure what to expect at the festival. We knew and supported the Gala Chorus's mission, changing the world through song. How wonderful is that? But we thought the Gala membership choruses were large, all-male groups that did big productions that sometimes included costumes and choreography. Coro Allegro is an SATB group that performs classical and contemporary art music, no bells and whistles. We just stood there and sang. We were nervous. Would the audiences enjoy our music? Well, we needn't have worried. The festival was so much more than we had imagined. The range of music, including women's music, gospel, and world music, the diversity of the other choruses, and the embracing acceptance of all queer people and our allies was overwhelming. And the audiences loved our music. Yes, we were different, but that was an asset. In short, we were hooked. Coro Allegro has attended every Gala Chorus's festival since then. We have also benefited from so many workshops, training events, seminars, conductor gatherings, and one-on-one -on -one advice sessions that Gala Chorus's has offered over the years. So it was with huge dismay that we learned late last year that the cancellation of the Gala Chorus's festivals due to the pandemic had caused enormous financial harm to Gala and threatened its survival. The leadership of Coro Allegro immediately turned to our singers and supporters, knowing they would rally to the cause, which I am proud to say they did, as did so many other choruses, singers, and supporters. We are thrilled that Gala Choruses has survived the storm. Coro Allegro established the Daniel Pinkham Award in 2008 to be given annually in memory of Daniel Pinkham and in recognition of outstanding contributors to classical choral music and the LGBTQ plus communities. He stands among the giants of contemporary composers. At Coro Allegro, we knew Daniel Pinkham more intimately. He was an early believer in the potential of Coro Allegro, and Daniel and his partner were frequent audience members and supporters. The parallels between Daniel Pinkham's relationship with Coro Allegro and Gayla Chorus's relationship with Coro Allegro are evident. Both were early supporters and both contributed tremendously to the quality of our work, our growth, and fulfillment of our mission. It is therefore a natural choice that Coro Allegro is presenting Gayla Chorus's with the 2021 Daniel Pinkham Award. It is my great pleasure to introduce Michael Tate, the president of the board of directors of Gala Choruses. Michael, it is an honor to present Coro Allegro's annual Daniel Pinkham Award to the board of directors and staff members of Gala Choruses for what all of you do in support of music in the LGBTQ plus communities and for your heroic efforts to survive and persevere through the COVID-19 pandemic. We are happy and relieved that you will continue with your great work and we look forward to many more years of partnership with you and your colleagues. Please accept this award. Bonnie, I am absolutely humbled, honored and touched to accept this award, um, the Daniel Pinkham Award from Cora Allegra on behalf of Gayla Choruses, our amazing staff, our board of directors, and really all of the volunteers and members who participate in Gayla Choruses. Uh, just knowing about Daniel Pinkham and the incredible impression that he had in the Boston area in the LGBTQ and the choral community, it is even more gratifying to be able to accept this award. And we accept it with humility and determination to keep doing what we're doing for the LGBTQ choral community. So again, my sincere thanks. Hey y'all, my name is Sam Brinton. I use they and them as my pronouns and I get to serve as the Vice President of Advocacy and Government Affairs at the Trevor Project, the nation's LGBTQ suicide prevention organization. Mm -hmm. Although that is what I do on a day-to-day -day basis, um, it's nary a day that goes by that I'm not 
I'm not singing. Uh, I've been doing this since I was little, and thankfully, I've, I've been doing this in a variety of gala choruses. Starting out when I showed up to Boston, um, I found places that were different from Kansas, that, that somewhere where I uh, could be really me. I found Coro, Allegro, and I found the Boston Game as Chorus. And even when I had to leave Boston and move to Washington, D.C., uh, moving on a Monday, by Tuesday, I was already joining um, the Game and Chorus of Washington, D.C. Each of us have a home in Gala. Each of us get to find a place where who we love and how we identify is not something to be ashamed of, but literally something to be celebrated. We can hear right next to us, right next to us, that we're not alone in this. That whether it be the opera or the, the Broadway or a pop, song we have someone to sing with that is something that i think uh makes gala special the ability to um to hold us all together i think i associate you with like probably two of my like most moving memories of gala mm -hmm. festival and one of them was um that i was so honored to be one of your plus ones when you spoke about conversion therapy at a major fundraiser i believe it was for the lgbtq plus youth choirs yeah it was really beautiful to watch a room of people know what I was talking about when I was talking about it. As I was, as I was explaining conversion therapy, most of the time people kind of like have heard of it. It's this, this foreign idea, but in a room full of queer people, there was shaking heads, there was nodding heads, there was closed eyes, there was tears because they'd felt it, they'd done it, they'd been through it. There was, I was not the only one. Um, but then to follow that event and go and listen to youth chorus after youth chorus after youth chorus and know that some of those young people were never ever going to have to be at the risk of conversion therapy because of the work we've done in the gala course and because of being ourselves openly and proudly and, and giving examples of of a life well lived, that is, I, I build on that memory of yours, Yoshi, and say that um, I loved sharing my story and I loved that my story basically could end and not have to be repeated with the next youth chorus. That was a great way to kind of um, tie all those knots together. And of course we get to go back when festival happens again in 2024 and sing about it. We're so excited to do this. We're, we're doing a big concert together in Boston called Letters to Our Children, Voices Across Generations for LGBTQ plus youth. And the centerpiece of it is a piece by Andrea Clearfield that is about um, Sam's story. And David, do you want to tell us about it? Sure. Four people from Coro who have identified as women have commissioned a piece uh, in honor of their mothers. Um, and one person who is also from a broader gala community uh, commissioned this piece called Here I Am, I Am Here. And they wanted to uh, highlight the story of Mimi LeMay and uh, her transgender son, Jacob. And my idea was to actually take that story and superimpose it with Sam's story, um, mm -hmm. with conversion therapy and, and the difference between, you know, mother's paths to how they, how they mm -hmm. try to help their children. Um, and it's a very powerful work. Um, I'm, I'm so excited to do it and uh, excited to be working with Mimi and uh, Jacob and also with Sam on this project. And they will be involved in the performance as well. Uh, Yoshi, do you want to talk a little bit about the project that's going to be connected to the performance? Yeah. Yes, I would be thrilled to talk about it. I'm I'm so excited. I've always wanted to work with Sam on something like this. And I think we found the right thing, which is both Mimi's story um, and Sam's story came out of letters, Mimi writing to Jacob, Sam writing to their 12 year old self. That's why the concert that this, that Andrew's work takes place in is called Letters to Our Children. And what we're hoping is that we can get everybody, maybe everybody watching to think about writing a letter to queer youth. It could be their own child. It could be like the child that they're envisioning. It could be the, their own past self. Um, as a person who works on a suicide prevention lifeline, I know the power of a parent's words. And so to see um, 
to see the letters coming forward, to, to know that this is gonna be more than a song, that this is gonna be a, a movement to, to give families the, the power to affirm, to give, um, you know, to give survivors of conversion therapy the power to affirm themselves, that, that you do not require a, 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 a Mimi in your life, right? You can be your own um, uh, fairy godmother. I think that's a really powerful thing this, this, this music is going to do. You all taught me from the Trevor Project that the presence of just one affirming adult can have an incredible impact. Absolutely. So just one supportive person in a person's, in a young person's life can reduce suicidal ideation by more than 40%. Like you can literally nearly have suicide <laughs> attempts just by being an affirming person. And to, to put that even to closer practice, as a person who uses they and them as my pronouns, right? To support a person's pronouns, to just use a person's pronouns can reduce suicidal ideation by more than 50%. So when when it's hard, when, when, when Mimi looked at uh, her child and said, I'm going to do this, right? I'm going to use the right pronouns. I'm going to try. When I am in a room uh, or a concert and someone uses the right pronouns, right? I know that that person is saving my life, is doing something that is actually actively saving my life. And that's what I hope this project also kind of highlights is that that one supportive person, that one supportive conversation where you, where you use someone's pronouns correctly can have a, a lasting impact. There's not very many songs about conversion therapy. Something that has caused such devastation in our community hasn't been given kind of the light. We, we've shined a light on a variety of different challenges that our community has faced and sung from our hearts and told the world, this is what we are experiencing. Whether it's, you know, Lady Gaga's born this way to this, the naked man. Like there's, there's so many pieces that have really spoken to queer experience and queer pain and, and turned it on its head and said, this is us. But not very many, if any at all, on the experiences of those of us who've experienced conversion therapy because it's almost like it was, uh, um, don't talk about the erasure. Don't talk about that, that time that we were nearly um, uh, removed from existence because people who've gone through it rarely can talk about those experiences in any way, shape or form. Like I, I, I was able to talk to both of you, you know, and my Coro family about my experiences, but I am a rarity. There is not very many survivors that can do that level of work, not because they're not strong enough, but because it's traumatic. It's traumatic to, to, to feel that pain again. I'm so excited that we get to, uh, in Coro, um, turn that on its head and say like, we move beyond conversion therapy. We, we call it out, we hold it, we understand that the pain exists and now we do something about it. We write a letter, we, we, we say, I can look back now at this pain, at a pandemic, at a, you know an AIDS crisis. I can look back, see, and do something. That is something that I think is really powerful and it's why I'm so excited uh, with Coro to return to a festival and share with who, who knows what young person is going to sit in that audience, realize that people have gone through conversion therapy and realize that they're safe. That is going to be like the perfect um, end. And so we're gonna invite everybody to meet us at Festival 2024. I am so excited to get to sing with you all. This is gonna be um, an amazing opportunity to just be in the room um, where change is happening.
Looking at the moon.